Okay, so next presentation, we have uh, two people presenting. So uh, first we have uh, Michael Dexter, who's been uh, doing a lot of work on FreeBSD for several years, uh, including some ZFS work. Uh, and our uh, second presenter is uh, Jorgen Lundman, who uh, two years ago uh, shocked us by uh, introducing ZFS on Windows. And uh, I believe they will speak about uh, ZFS support on different platforms. Hello, hello. Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. So yes, uh, my name's Michael, this is Jorgen, and we love OpenZFS. So he's in a funny habit of porting it, and I'm in a funny habit of deploying it on a number of systems. Now, uh, he's well known for his then known as a Mac OS X work which is now Mac OS, back in 2013, way, way, way back. And most recently, as you've just mentioned, he's surprised us all with an announcement of uh, ZFS for Windows. I have a humble lab of 10 or so identical E3 Xeon-based machines, some E5 machines, and some compellents that uh, turn out to be surprisingly good FreeBSD and other open source OS machines. And they're all equipped with SSDs, which I'll touch on later. So a very brief history of uh, the history of uh, OpenZFS on other platforms. Naturally, the, the source of truth was OpenSolaris for Open Z what became OpenZFS. But real early on, Apple was involved with hey, their own work prior to the acquisition. And there are still remnants of that you'll bump into. And the Linux Fuse work as an experiment was remarkably early also. But for the sort of mainstream that we're all familiar with, FreeBSD was one of the earliest players. NetBSD with a rather dated implementation, followed by OpenSolaris. Uh, Don, your Zevo work, that treated me very well, and I've, I've have been running ZFS on a Mac for many, many years. And naturally, the modern era we're familiar with, which I will describe here. Much of this has been discussed today such that, well, Illumos has traditionally been pulling from itself, but it looks like there's an announcement to truly unify over the next few years. Linux has been very much an authoritative repo, along with FreeBSD. And Jorgen has been pulling from initially Illumos, I believe, for macOS, and then from macOS for Windows. So that lineage is in motion, along with a number of topics today. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to report that these slides are out of date as of two hours ago. <laughs> Thanks to a new OmniOS CE release that was, yeah, literally a moment ago. So the feature flag gap. This is directly from NetBSD, and it has remarkable coverage on feature flags. And I believe in this room, Matt, you probably introduced the whole notion of feature flags to accommodate differences, and you're winning. This is good. This is very good. So as we work our way up, FreeBSD 11.2, Actually, I may have done this on 12.1, which also shipped like 12 hours ago. <laughs> so it is working its uh, way to get ahead of, say, NetBSD. Uh, no, <laughs> as of two hours ago, OmniOS CE no longer lacks native encryption. I'm sure others, but I haven't booted up in the while sitting here. Uh, but hey, as a new effort that's been sinking, uh, Mac OS and Windows are remarkably up to date, which is quite impressive. And moving on to you know, FreeBSD and ZOL, it's like we're staying modern. And so all in all, feature flags for the win. That uh, I believe is being proven to be the right approach. But in all practice, in all practicality, you want to just sit down and install an OS and have ZFS everywhere. So naturally, Illumos and Solaris have had definitive root on ZFS. And FreeBSD brought that in very early on with, thank you, Alan, for installer support, such that it's a painless process. It's a bit fledgling on GNU Linux, but I'll go into details. And NetBSD, no notion of that yet. And Jorgen will describe the adventures on the two least Unix OSs out there. <laughs> so breaking news as of the 10th, I believe, of October. Uh, Ubuntu 19.10 shipped with experimental ZFS support. And it's there. It's I'm not a lawyer. I will not comment one bit on anything legal related. I'm here for the tech. So uh, I've deployed on a number of systems. It comes up. It has two pools, which was interesting. They've done a boot pool. They've done a 
rest of the OS pool, and uh, a little about the partitioning because there are games that need to be played on any given OS, and we'll, I'll talk more about that later. But there's some output of what it actually looks like. And uh, some implementations partition for you and give you what they give you. And others just say, well, you hand me a partition, I'll put ZFS there. If you give me a raw disk, I'll put it there, whatever you please. So the boot pool has, is, I believe, V28 with all feature flags disabled. Probably to accommodate grub, which is an issue I'll touch on later. Um, it, who's familiar with Proxmox? It's a KVM-based uh, virtualization competitor, pretty much open source, alternative to VMware, etc. A few months ago, they introduced root on ZFS. They also do it with a single pool, which that's what the user experience should look like and is, a, is gradually appearing like, and that's, that's from months ago. And they do have a number of feature flags enabled right out of the gate. That's impressive. That's where we want to be. So is it ZFS when you sit down and say, this is ZFS? Well, I did a simple baton pass where I generate some garbage from random, and I check some it, and then I start passing it between all the systems in the lab. So going from, I went with the ZOLOF abbreviation to make it more clear that it is the ZO. ZOF work, but not everyone's heard that term. So what I mean is the ZFS on Linux on FreeBSD. So I went from FreeNAS to, in my familiar territory, to ZOF. From ZOF to FreeBSD ARM64, which is an interesting area. And then on to OmniOS CE, OmniOS CE to Ubuntu 1910, and from there on to Debian 10, often at BSD, off to Mac OS, and finally I, I've been struggling with this, but I could pull from Windows and get it in there and eventually put it on an actual Solaris machine, 11.2, ran their MD5 checksum utility and went full circle. So that's a very good smoke test. Now, the Oracle ZFS question. I started sending between systems to and from what I have currently is a Oracle Proper Oracle Solaris 11.2 and 11.4. If someone has an 11.3 USB image, I'll gladly borrow that and get three in the lab, 11.3. So I found I could send anything to uh, Solaris 11.2. It was remarkably tolerant of even new pool formats with feature flags, which was confusing. Uh, but it really didn't like to send out elsewhere or receive anything to 11.4. That uh, begins to answer, Matt, your question of who, who broke it and when. Maybe 11.3 will shed more light into it, but I was not successful even sending V28 pools back and forth, snapshots from V28 pools, which was surprising. Uh, would anyone in this room benefit from passing between true Oracle Solaris and an open ZFS platforms or not? Because it's academic, it's a curiosity, but these appear to be different file systems at this point. So a few numbers, and this has fortunately been touched on today. All benchmarks are wrong, <laughs> and especially if you're talking different OSs and various experiments. So what you see here is largely a smoke test, but uh, FIO is not available on Solaris, yet they have IO zone and there are various uh, issues with licensing that various distributions complain about. So I just wanted to get out, the, out of the gate some numbers, uh, compression off, Sync always, let's look at the worst case scenario because you can quickly benchmark your RAM, no problem. You'll have great numbers, everyone's happy, but they're completely wrong. So as for partially wrong, we've got a block size of 128, size of one gig, a uh, read and write, which there was a point that, hey, write's what you really care about, but why not? Let's, let's go there and sync at the end. Uh, what I can afford for 20 machines is the crucial BX500 120 gig drive. They're plentiful. They have blocks written reporting, which is very nice. So that gets interesting, and it was touched on, I believe, earlier. I've written to the file system. Well, we compressed it. We did all these wonderful things. What actually hit the device? Because with a drive providing that information, you can do an actual feedback loop of like, well, what really took place? Don't save that information to the same device because you'll pollute your data as you go, but that's okay. So uh, Mac OS CFS, read and write, uh, surprisingly pleasant. APFS did. Uh, surprisingly better, but that's okay. I've heard of it having its own set of shortcomings. Not too worried. 
Windows ZFS under this test performed very well. Throw a video editing type validation test for your performance from your local storage or network storage, and uh, you might start off great and somewhat drop a bit, but Jorgen will talk about that in a moment. Okay, NetBSD, okay, it's keeping up, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it outperformed the local UFS. That's a surprise, worth investigating, but uh, we're triple digit there. Omni OS CE, I cannot explain why that didn't perform so well, because you'd think that is the quintessential implementation. That's a conversation for later. Ubuntu right off the, out of the gate did not perform well. That was a surprise. It is an older dot seven variation. Certainly up, not up to date. Uh, Debian, close to the triple digits. Debian native also underperformed. I think it's exe4, but whatever Debian does by default. I didn't want to dig into that because it doesn't interest me. FreeNAS did very well. I'm, I'm very impressed. And in my previous testing before with the last generation of snapshots, uh, ZOF was doing very well. It was outperforming all the others, but these are all moving targets. And and I'm fine with that because that's the nature of it. And that's like, hey, release is showing up during a talk. So here's where I'd really like to explore more. Is anyone running ZFS on ARM? ARM64? Anyone? I've got a wavy hand, a few wavy hands. So the now discontinued uh, Soft Iron Overdrive 1000 is a great affordable machine that quite a few open source developers have across the BSDs and elsewhere and the Zen folks. And it can take two drives, which is all I'm asking for. So it's identical drives in an ARM64 machine. And I'm pleasantly surprised by that. It's not penalized by its differentness. It's not penalized by uh, the fact that it's an entirely different architecture. So on this note, this, uh, these are smoke tests. Send me what interests you. I'm more than happy to run a few things in parallel against all these machines, let you know what comes out of that. So where do we want to be? Ah, uh, I think boot environments are brilliant, and I love to nest them entirely such the entire OS is under a given boot environment, even if it's you know, FreeBSD 11, 12, head, you name it. Uh, we can send between the two. I would really like to send an OS from one pool to another and choose at boot time how we, you know, what we in fact boot. Now, I'm not worried about OpenZFS and all this. You're doing very, very well. Like pat on the back, beverages tonight, you name it. That's the part that's working brilliantly. Out in the wild, when, well, I work with uh, NAS systems and look at the competition and look at what features they support and you ask questions like, oh, so SAS multipathing, what's that? <laughs> uh, software encryption. It's on a few competing NAS systems, fine. Native encryption is very exciting because that's coming up in all the medical fields where there's a big checkbox that must be checked. And given that the software encryption on FreeBSD is very different from that on Linux, and I don't know what Lumos is doing, if anything, for software encryption, anything? Nope, for native, just on any given file system, uh, something equivalent to Gelly or Lux. Suddenly, that's where ZFS gets really exciting because it, you type the same command in a number of OSs and good things happen. So, uh, in practice, I thought, okay, let me jump in on the Linux box and get a, <clears throat> the disk labels and partition labels. And I found a lovely Stack Overflow post on the half dozen ways to do that on that OS, whereas I'm familiar with, well, you just type the command that gives you the status. That's, that's what you do. So there were a number of choices on what you could do to get different formatting out of and a number of answers that are all difficult to parse, by the way. So that said, uh, I say it takes a village. Uh, it's what's surrounding OpenZFS that will be the challenges moving forward and with Ubuntu shipping with essentially root on ZFS here and now, uh, those inboxes of yours and forums and others will fill up pretty quickly with, with questions about these many, many things. So uh, one experience from my Beehive work, Grub didn't ship a release for several years. Just they didn't. And it was very 
different by the time there was a release and certain things were no longer supported. Uh, everything relating, related to Grub2 Beehive that lets you launch Linux, yes. Well, they changed all the things out from under us. Oh, partitioning, yes. It, there are a number of tools for uh, Linux. It, there's a captive tool on Solaris format and that becomes very frustrating when you've just a moment ago ran all the same ZFS commands, you've run maybe even the same file commands across the whole spectrum of OSs and then suddenly you want a simple thing like a disk label and it's, it's a remarkably difficult thing to obtain. Uh, back to the SAS multipathing, each OS handles that differently and uh, self-encrypting drives. Fortunately, on newer things like that, there are utilities provided by the foundations that set these standards uh, to assist with that. Oh, on the recent call, there was the differences of metadata between different platforms where all those ACLs on be it uh, OS1 or OS2 are very, very different. The fault management handling on FreeBSD, that's ZFSD, on Linux, that's Z. On Illumos, that's fault management, I believe the term. <laughs> and they're all very, very different. And suddenly there's a, a post out there, Proxmox as a NAS. Well, it's uh, not making any notion of what you do in case of trouble. Hopefully that'll be resolved, but uh, we're at the mercy of this ecosystem. Observability tools, perfect segue from the last few talks. It's like, wow, okay. Sometimes vendors change OS and they invest heavily in all the observability of one OS and move to another and think, wait, this worked great previously. And, and literally from the last talk, the fact that there are you know, these higher level interpretations of what you can get from the system are a very good thing because hopefully we can hide all these OS differences down below. Uh, machine parsability of utility output. Uh, I, I deal with unhappy disks all day and smart data is very important to me personally. And there is a def there's an open standard on the protocol, that's good. Uh, there's a de facto standard utility that makes no effort to be you know, machine readable. <laughs> I'm sure everyone in this room has used that tool. But as we drill down into Alan's, say, VDEV properties, which we'll hear about tomorrow, Suddenly we're looking, you know, I, th I think of OS and a file system and the actual hardware behind that file system that's servicing it uh, is pretty intertwined and suddenly maybe a case can be made that it's uh, ZFS's duty to maybe have a little bolt-on add-on component to properly obtain smart information, present it to the user as an option. Because often out in the ecosystem the tools are not so good. And back to ARM64. Uh, I saw flyby earlier, I believe uh, Debian PowerPC was it? That was used in a slide. There are still alternative architectures out there and there were conversations earlier about uh, uh, RISC-V, other exciting new nicely licensed architectures coming online. Uh, that's all very exciting and I do want ZFS is on all the things because I want to send the backup from my phone or my, you name it, elsewhere. Ah, PowerShell, I, I'll leave that one to you on PowerShell hating binary data. It's just like, no, we don't want to do that. So things like a send from PowerShell, the, the, the new Windows shell is a challenge. And you're probably thinking, well, not my problem, not my fault. Well, it's like, that's true, but this is the ecosystem we're in, working in. And uh, those are the bumps ahead of us as we get everything right internally to open ZFS. And again, things like Gpart, it's a standard, but uh, wow, the tools vary <laughs> dramatically. So given the short format, I wanted to move quick, hopefully wake you up as you're recovering from uh, the afternoon uh, lull and leave time for questions. So Jorgen will talk about his work. Okay, so I'm Jorgen. I've uh, been working on the Mac and the Windows ports. And I thought I'd just take this time to kind of do a status uh, where we're at at the moment. I'm afraid I don't have an announcement, so, you know, follow your expectations there. 
The current version for Mac is 193, which is almost identical to the previous version, 192. Bec and the only reason we had to push this out was because Catalina changes. They made some changes in the kernel that surprised us, uh, which you could argue is my fault to start with. But so we pushed out a new release just for Catalina. In case you're updating, you should go to 193 first. We now support uh, Mac OS 10.11 to Catalina. We can do earlier versions. And well, it was just a hassle to compile for every version there is. There's so many now, so we cut some off. They're already end of life, I believe, anyway. Um, and while I was uh, working on Catalina, I had to try um, a setup booting ZFS, booting on ZFS. And for the mm, some of you might know that previously we had booting on ZFS, but there were some problems, like fonts wouldn't work, which is somewhat inconvenient. Uh, but we found that fonts now actually work. Uh, not entirely sure if I fixed something or if Apple changed something. I must admit I'm a little bit tempted to go back to see you know, where it was fixed, but I don't really have time for that at the moment. We'll see. Um, the future plans is to change our repository to connect to the f uh, Linux one, which is ironic considering I came from Linux to start with, so we're going to go back to the old way, I suppose. Uh, hopefully that goes well, but we'll see. Uh, we're waiting for FreeBSD to finish first, and then we'll uh, try our version. I wanted to show a um, one of my developers did a, a GUI thing, a widget, which looks like this. So if you are going to run ZFS on Mac, there is a little helpful widget. You don't have to do anything in command line, although I'm, I'm sure we all prefer command line. But at least it's something. It looks good. Right? No? OK. <laughs> um, that does not ship with uh, ZFS just yet, but maybe in the future we can ship it with it. And then on Windows, we have a version 2.0. I think it's actually version 2.1 or 2.1, 21. Yeah. I make up these version numbers. I figured it's alpha, so I can make whatever number I want, right? <laughs> uh, I think of it still as alpha, even though maybe I could move to beta, but really I don't want more users to run it. Um, ironically, I went down the path to figure out how to do a signed installer because you have to code sign on Windows and you have to ship it up and they stamp it and you get it back. So I wanted to solve that puzzle, which was rather difficult. That unfortunately meant that almost anyone can run it now, which meant people are running it. What, it wasn't really my plan, but you know that's okay. You can't boot it at all. I haven't looked at booting, but uh, I believe I know how to do it. It's just a matter of actually wanting to do it because I have a feeling more people will run it. <laughs> so I might wait for that one. And I wanted to mention the uh, Ubuntu for Windows, the LX. Oh, I'm not sure what it's called. Is it LX? Right. Yeah. The right yeah. The um, took a bit to make that work on top of ZFS, which is on top of Windows. But we have managed to get it to work, which is nice. The reason I mentioned it is because those guys, those developers have been very helpful to uh, basically try to figure out some of the problems. Uh, there are some black boxes. For example, my nemesis on Windows is the trash can. It's such a useful thing to be able to support, but apparently people want a trash can. And it's been rather difficult to get to work. Uh, likewise on OS X, it's the spotlight that has been the biggest problem. They're just black boxes, so you don't really know why it doesn't work and so on. I believe, yeah, that's the status of the two ports that I work on. The small port, I guess. <laughs> yeah. One pleasant surprise in all of this was that there is Hyper-V Core. Who's familiar with that? Anyone? A few hands, two hands. It's a freely downloadable competitor to, say, ESXi and Proxmox and all the things that it's hard to compete with when they're free. OpenZFS installs just fine. Chrome installs just fine. And there's a graphical Windows Server administration tool that works just fine. So free of charge, you can have those things. I've 
pretty much talk about this last five years, which is ZFS plus a hypervisor. <laughs> Have those will travel. So uh, that's exciting, and it's basically Windows without the Candy Crush Pro ads and other garbage that comes along with proper Windows. So that was a very pleasant surprise. How are we on time? I guess we had a cancellation later, but. So we have one more presentation which is optional students. Uh, let's let's start to do the Q and A. Yeah, perfect. Questions? <laughs> and not why? <laughs> That's irrelevant. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tom. So the question is, is this the best approach? You've downloaded WSL for Linux on Windows. It's working with the Linux OpenZFS kernel module, you're saying? And that provided you essentially real ZFS at your fingertips. But that's a bit of a roundabout approach. Is that a better way, or should we go native and put up with all the headaches of uh, trash cans? Yeah. Oh, I see. It was for me, wasn't it? Um, I don't really think they're mutually exclusive, per se. Um, uh, if you can get the performance out of the, the, the Linux environment, then you certainly run that. Uh, the reason I ported ZFS or ZFS to Windows is mostly to challenge myself, right? I don't really think anyone's going to put out huge storage and then running Windows. Or maybe they are. I don't know. They keep surprising me. Um, but hopefully both can exist, I think. That would be nice. Yeah. Do I track the number of users and uh, on either platforms? I probably should a bit more. I mean, I have all the logs if you want to see all the downloads and so on. Uh, we don't have any callback code or anything like that, call home code. There's nothing like that. Brew. And Brew does, uh, has it installed, yeah. I'm not sure why people like doing binary installs from Brew, but um, I think on the Mac, it's in the hundreds. And Windows is still under 100, right? So that's, you know, that's good. So they're not particularly large ports, I don't think. I hope. Yeah. One more. What did I do for the signed installer on Windows? As in, where did I get the certificate from, or? Uh, I used Inno Setup, which is a setup program, I guess. So you just give it a script and it compiles it all for you and then signs it. It took me forever to find that one. I wish someone had told me what to use, right? <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.